Hello, and thank you for attending this uh, webinar on uh, the health of Lake Simcoe. Um, I'm Brian Ginn, and I'm the Lake Scientist with Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority um, in Newmarket. Uh, I'm presenting this to you at Honda Canada on behalf of the Lake Simcoe Conservation Foundation. And I just want to start off by thanking Honda Canada for their generous donation towards the Nature and Education Center, um, which is planned to be built uh, in the near future at uh, Scanlon Creek Conservation Area uh, here in Bradford. Uh, I usually start off these talks with this satellite shot, just kind of a family portrait, if you will, of the Great Lakes region. Lake Simcoe is located uh, down here on the right-hand side, about halfway between Lake Ontario and the Georgia Bay portion of Lake Huron. Um, lake Simcoe is the largest lake in South Central Ontario, 722 square kilometers. About half a million people uh, live within its watershed. Uh, and recreationally, it's uh, one of the premier boating, uh, cottaging, and also uh, fishing destinations um, in Southern Ontario. Uh, I think it's billed as the ice fishing capital of Canada, and I think 80% of the entire fishing um, effort on the lake happens uh, during the ice cover during the winter season. Uh, this is just an uh, kind of a close-up satellite shot of Lake Simcoe, um, that kind of grayish brown area. On the left-hand side is the city of Barrie. Uh, Aurelia is the grayish brown area at the top. And then at the bottom, uh, you can just make out a little bit of the Holland Marsh. Uh, Aurora and Newmarket are just out of the frame of this picture. Uh, the lake itself is divided up into three main areas. Cook's Bay at the south is kind of a shallow, kind of nutrient-enriched uh, area with lots of plants. Uh, if you're a perch or bass fisherman, uh, that's where you want to be to capture those species. Uh, it almost acts like a little version of Lake Erie, and what we learned about on Lake Simcoe can actually be applied to larger Great Lakes as well. This arm moving off to the left or the west here is Kempenfelt Bay. Um, very, this is where the deepest depths in the lake are. 42 meters is the deep spot in the lake. And uh, because it gets so deep so fast, very clear waters almost resembles a tiny version of Lake Ontario. And then of course there's the rest of the lake is called the main lake or the main basin. And that almost resembles Lake Huron as well. So what we learn about the ecology and the environment on Lake Simcoe, we're actually scaling up um, to tackle problems on the larger Great Lakes as well, just not just in, a, in addition to tackling problems on Lake Simcoe. Uh, so our role at the LSRCA in lake research, uh, we have a lake research monitoring program, which uh, we've been working on since 2008. Uh, historically, um, environmental monitoring on the lake has been under the jurisdiction of the province of Ontario, Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks, or MECP, um, since the 1980s has been monitoring offshore water quality, so water quality in deep water areas, um, plankton related things, algae pollution complaints, and so on. Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, or MNRF, uh, have been looking after all things fish related, so cold water fish such as lake trout, lake whitefish, also warm water fish, and so on. Uh, this left a data gap uh, in lake monitoring in the shallow water area of what we call the near shore zone, which makes up about two thirds of the entire lake area. And that's where uh, the Conservation Authority comes in. So we look at the water quality in this near shore zone. We also look at things like aquatic plants, um, the effect of climate change, also invasive species and so on. And really a lot of our monitoring program is driven to address the concerns of residents. So what, do, what are they feeling about the lake? What are their primary concerns? And then scientifically, what's causing these problems that may be issues to them? And we also look at new and emergency, emerging issues as well. So for instance, the impact of climate change on the lake, invasive species, and so on. Uh, the main research platform that we use on the lake is our research vessel, the Hexagenia. This uh, was purchased through private donations uh, by the Lake Simcoe Conservation Foundation. Uh, we named it the Hexagenia, which is a species of mayfly or shadfly, which are shown in this picture at the bottom here. Um, they are an, an indicator of clean water. Um, back historically, uh, there used to be many thousands of these would hatch out in Lake May or the start of June, and they'd cover cottages and trees and so on on the side of the lake. Uh, they used to be common, but as environmental quality in Lake Simcoe degraded, uh, they became less and less. So one thing that we want with cleaner waters in Lake Simcoe is the return of these mayflies or shadflies back to Lake Simcoe. And that's one reason why we named our research vessel after this one species. This is something that we want to see return. And this lack of oxygen, which affected the mayflies, is mainly due to nutrient inputs such as phosphorus. And it also affects cold water fish, such as lake trout and lake whitefish. And I'll be talking a little bit about that today. So the three main key environmental stressors to Lake Simcoe are phosphorus, which is a nutrient which gets into the lake. And when that gets in, that causes things like algal blooms, it causes plants to grow, and it also results in low oxygen conditions in the bottom of the lake. And that has implications to the fish community. 
Uh, also invasive species are another one. People are familiar with zebra mussels, but there's also quagga mussels and invasive plants and so on. And the impact that these invasive species have on biological communities and also climate change, which is a global issue affecting us here at the local uh, at the local level as well. So things like changing precipitation patterns, uh, the waters in the lake are warmer than what they historically were in the past during the summertime. And this translates into a shortened uh, period of ice cover on the lake. Uh, just this past year, Kempenfeld Bay had its shortest period of ice cover, 55 days, and it's 153 year history that we've been monitoring it on. And also climate change, uh, changing precipitation patterns impact things like how phosphorus is delivered to the lake and also give an advantage for invasive species to survive. Uh, so the first thing I'll talk about is climate change. As I said, the lake is getting warmer than what it was in the past, and the warm water period of the lake has increased by about a month relative to 1980. Um, it's just, just warmer at the top of the lake. Uh, the deep water temperatures have also increased by about four degrees Celsius since 1980, and that has implications because warmer water holds less oxygen, so this impacts the cold water fish communities. Uh, Kempenfeld Bay does have one of the longest ice records in Canada. And there's been a, a decline of over a month uh, based on the period record from the 1850s through until now. Um, the other issue that I said is the main hot topic on Lake Simcoe is phosphorus. Um, why we're so concerned about this. Phosphorus is a nutrient and it's a limiting nutrient. Uh, if you're a gardener or you have a lawn, you can add it to make your vegetables grow or you can also make your lawn green. But that same element that makes your lawn green, if it gets into your water in too great of an amount, it'll also turn your lake green, such as shown by this algal bloom in Lake Erie on the bottom picture. So phosphorus enters the lake. This is a process what in the lake business we call eutrophication, which is just a fancy word for nutrient enrichment. It causes excessive plant and algae growth. And then when these things die off, they fall to the bottom of the lake. And this, by breaking down and by decomposing, this actually consumes oxygen, which reduces oxygen levels in the lake for things like fish. So the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan, which is our current environmental management plan on the lake, um, sets a target for dissolved oxygen of seven milligrams per liter. And from the lake side, it's pretty much based on a healthy and sustainable cold water fish community. So we want healthy and sustainable lake trout, lake whitefish, and cisco or lake herring and so on. They're called cold water fish because they can't tolerate warm water. So during the year when the water warms up at the top, they tend to retreat down to the bottom of Kempenfeld Bay where the water is nice and cool. But unfortunately, this is also the part of the lake which tends to run out of oxygen in late summer and early fall. So in order to have a happy fish community, we need a target minimum level at the end of summer of seven milligrams per liter for a dissolved oxygen concentration. And when you back calculate this through, this is where this 44 tons of phosphorus per year loading objective comes from. And that's why we're trying to limit the amount of phosphorus getting into Lake Simcoe to 44 tons per year or less. Um, lake Simcoe is rather unique in that we don't just uh, model the phosphorus that's going into the lake, we actually go out and we do hands-on measurement of these as well. So we measure all the major components of phosphorus where it's going into the lake, so surface runoff from urban areas, from forests, from wetlands, from agricultural fields and so on, atmospheric dust that gets blown in, we measure from sewage treatment plants, also septic areas and so on. And in fact, we base our phosphorus loading amounts on about 3 million data points that we collect each year and then these have to be ground truthed and figured out and make sure that they're right. And we use this to calculate the phosphorus load. So what the phosphorus load looks like, this bar graph here just shows the total phosphorus load in tons per year from year 2000 to the year 2017. And these are hydrologic years, which means they run from June 1st um, one year to May 31st the following year. So 2017, for example, runs from June 1st, 2017 through to May 31st, 2018. Different colors on these bars are those different components of the mo of the, the uh, monitoring that I mentioned. So tributaries and surface runoff is that green bar, sewage treatment plants is red, atmospheric um, component is blue and so on. So the height of the bar is the amount of in uh, tons per year that's going into the lake. The most recent year was 131 tons. That black bar across the center is the 44 ton loading objective. So the loads are above what that is and it's primarily driven by high tributary flows. So the amount of water going into the lake is what really what's driving up these phosphorus loads. So that's the amount of water that's going into the lake. Inside the lake, phosphorus shows a bit of a different story in that relative to the 1980s. So this graph just shows spring phosphorus concentrations, which is the highest concentration in the lake. Relative to the 1980s, they've actually improved. And over the past five years of, of the monitoring that are on this graph, the average is around 7.3 micrograms per liter. And that's really good because the provincial water quality objective is less than 10. So we're actually meeting that objective despite what's going on with the amount of phosphorus going into the lake. 
The dissolved oxygen story is also improving relative to the 1980s. So this graph just shows the end of summer or the minimum amount of dissolved oxygen that we have in the lake. And that kind of dotted black bar on the far right is the seven milligrams per liter Lake Simcoe Protection Plan target. Um, we've crossed it on two occasions, but we're actually getting very, very close. And over the past five years, the average has been about 6.2 micrograms or milligrams per liter. So, so if you look at the graph of what's going on inside the lake conditions are actually improving, whereas outside the lake things to be with, with that bar graph, things seem to be quite variable, going up and down and so on. So our main question that we're researching on Lake Simcoe now is what's going on? If you look at a limnological textbook, the first thing that they say when you open up the phosphorus chapter is that if you increase the amount of phosphorus going into the lake, you increase the amount in a lake and that lowers the amount of oxygen. Just as an example for this, if you add more scoops to a pot of coffee that you're making, your coffee it will be stronger. So if you think of your coffee scoops as the loading and then the how strong you like your coffee is the concentration. What's happening in Lake Simcoe is that we're adding more scoops of coffee to it, if you will, but the concentration is not staying the same. The strength of our coffee, if you will, is relatively weak. So what the theory says is that if we have 131 tons of loading like we did in 2017-18, phosphorus concentration in the lake should be between 13 and 18, and then your oxygen should be very low at the end of summer. What's actually happening is a phosphorus concentration in the lake stayed low and oxygen stayed quite well. So what's going on? Why is Lake Simcoe defying this limnological textbook theory that pretty much our entire lake management plan is based on? And we have a few different um, ideas that we're working through. One of these is climate change is affecting the lake somehow and also how the water is getting into the lake. There's some biological changes going on or invasive species might be uh, sh showing a role. And this is really where science gets exciting is that we're pushing new ground and we're looking at things that nobody else has ever seen before and we're doing it right here on Lake Simcoe. So the first of these is climate and hydrology. Climate is changing, there's no arguing that, but it's not just warmer temperatures, it's precipitation is changing and the precipitation patterns are changing. What we found in the past 10 or 15 years or so is, is that we're getting more intense summer storms. So you're getting these sudden thunderstorms, these sudden downbursts that dump a lot of water in a very short amount of time. And an example of this here are these two pictures. Um, they show the Ghost Canal in Newmarket. Um, the top picture is just an average day in June, what it usually looks like. And then after one of these downburst events where you have, you, you can see relative to that canal wall on the far side, the water's completely up over it, actually flooding the field and the walking trail in behind it. And one of these uh, reasons why in 2017-18 we had 131 tons is because one of these storms in two days dumped 13 tons of phosphorus into the lake. And you're getting a lot more of these intense summer downbursts that drive a lot of water and then a lot of phosphorus into the lake. Also in the winter time as well, we're not getting precipitation in snow. We tend to be getting precipitation in the form of rain during the winter, which is different and which is weird. And rain on frozen ground, same thing. There's no place for that phosphorus to soak into the ground to be absorbed. It's drying directly off into tributaries and streams. And it's drying directly into the lake. So these fast storms and these winter rainstorms are delivering phosphorus differently than what it has in the past. And there's no real reason for this phosphorus to be buffered out inside the watershed. And if you remember that bar graph that I showed you before, 70 to 80% of that bar is that green load from the tributaries and from the polder marshes. And it's these extreme events and these winter rains that are driving up the loads. And we need more research to understand what's happening here. Also on the invasive species front, uh, we have two species of invasive mussels in the lake. First of these in the top picture is zebra mussels. Most people are very familiar with them. Uh, they've been around uh, in the lake since the 1980s and in the Great Lakes region since the, 19, uh, since the 1980s. Uh, they arrived in Lake Simcoe first. They have a life strategy that I like to call live fast and die young. They're really a boom and bust. They get into a lake, they rapidly increase in population very quickly, and then they gradually run out of space and food, and then the population crashes and they die off limiting features on zebra mussels is that they need warm water. It has to be warmer than 12 degrees Celsius. They also need lots of food to survive and they really need hard substrates to survive. This bottom picture is um, a species of invasive mussel that people are less familiar with. It's called a quagga mussel. They arrived second, so they arrived in Lake Simcoe around 2004. They're really an advanced form of zebra mussels in that they can survive in cold water, they can tolerate low food, and they can also survive on mud and soft substrates. All these things that limited zebra mussels, really the quagga mussels can survive on. And in lakes where they both exist, they tend to replace zebra mussels in about seven to nine years after they invade. 
So we've done some studies on invasive mussels in Lake Simcoe. Uh, 2009, we went out, we took crab samples and mud samples from the bottom of the lake um, from 744 sites. And we took all that data and we used it to create these maps of where zebra mussels and quagga mussels were in Lake Simcoe. So on this map, all the blue area is areas where zebra mussels were found. And the darker the blue color means that there's a higher amount or a higher population of zebra mussels in that area. You can see the white area in the center of the, of the lake. That means that there's no zebra mussels found there. And that's because in Lake Simcoe, there's a change from relatively hard substrates to this soft mud and silt that zebra mussels sink into and they get smothered. This was in 2009. We went back in 2015, we redid this study and we were surprised to find out that zebra mussels were almost entirely eradicated in Lake Simcoe. And even if you go on Lake Simcoe today, you'd be very hard pressed to find an actual zebra mussel in the lake. What people are finding are actually the second species, which are quagga mussels. So in 2009, when zebra mussels dominated, there were a lot of them. We also did the same thing with quagga mussels as well. And you can see there's a light kind of corally pink color on this map. That means there were quagga mussels present, but not really a lot of them. And again, in the center of the lake, they never really had any there. When we went back in 2015, we found quagga mussels almost everywhere. And you can see a lot more of this dark kind of coral color on there. That means there's higher concentration of quagga mussels. And quagga mussels completely replaced the zebra mussels in Lake Simcoe. And as you can see, that area in the center of the lake, which was used to be white, where there were no mussels found, there's quagga mussels living right to the bottom of Lake Simcoe now because they can survive on silt, they can tolerate cold, and they can survive on low food. So what does this mean to the lake? Zebra and quagga mussels are both filter feeders, which means they take water into their bodies and they filter out algae and particles from it. And they filter so much, one mussel can filter about a gallon of water a day. And when you calculate that through with the population of mussels in the lake, they filter a volume equivalent to Lake Simcoe in about a little under three days. All these particles have phosphorus in it. So they're really taking in all this particular phosphorus and they're using it inside their own bodies. And research in the Great Lakes show that quagga mussels actually control nutrient levels in the lower Great Lakes region. This increases the clarity of the water because you're filtering all these particles out. It also increases dissolved phosphorus. So they're taking in phosphorus in solid form and they're kind of leaking it out in kind of a liquid form. And of course, this higher water quality, water clarity and more dissolved phosphorus means that there's an increase in aquatic plants in Lake Simcoe. So we've also done studies on aquatic plants. We also found out that they've increased a lot. So just like those muscle maps that I showed you, only these ones show plants, all the green areas on these maps are where aquatic plants are found in the lake. And the darker the green color, it means there's higher aquatic plants being found. And you can see the darker green colors are found in kind of the sheltered areas. So in Cook's Bay, on kind of the sheltered side of Georgina and Thora Islands and so on, and also in these little bays. There's lots of light, they're shallow, there's soft substrates that the plants can really root into, and they're relatively protected with lots of nutrients. You can see as you move from left to right through these three maps, the green color gets darker and darker, and that's because there's an increase in the amount of plant we found that over this 10 year period, plants increased by about five fold or five time increase in the amount of aquatic plants in Lake Simcoe just in this one decade. And this increase is mostly due to one invasive species that got into the lake. And it now makes up about two thirds of all the aquatic plants in Lake Simcoe is this one invasive species. And that species is starry stonewort, which is shown here. There's one individual of it shown on the right hand picture. And then it forms these kind of dense mats or these clouds, we call them pillows on the bottom of the lake. You can see these. And that's this other picture kind of at the lower left. It was first found in the St. Lawrence River in the mid 1970s. We found it in Lake Simcoe in 2009. And really what it is, is it's not typically a plant, it's a macroalgae. It's got more in common that seaweed that you find on either the Atlantic or the Pacific coast than it does with actual aquatic plants, but it's a freshwater version of that seaweed. What separates out algae from plants is that they don't have roots, so all the nutrients have to come from the surrounding water. So all those liquid nutrients that the mussels are leaching out, we think it's going into this macroalgae, so into these starry stone wards. What are the consequences to shallow water habitat? It's not just that it's obliterating every other plant species in the lake. If you look at a usual aquatic plant kind of um, community at the bottom of the lake in the shallow water. It almost looks like an underwater forest. And even with other invasive species, there's a lot of thin stock plants and then they kind of got bushy stalks on them. And it's a little forest with lots of shelter and so on for bait fish to survive. Also predatory fish such as muskie and so on. They're ambush predators, which means they can kind of leak, jump out from behind a plant and kind of grab one of these bait fish. Starry stonewort, on the other hand, forms this impenetrable wall of plant or algae material, if you will, that goes through. So you're really taking all that habitat space that's being filled up with plant material and you're forcing all those fish into the offshore region. So that's 
making bait fish and so on more susceptible to predators, which means that could have an impact on the, on the, on the uh, fish communities which are going on in Lake Simcoe. So we look at all these things on Lake Simcoe because assessing health, human health or environmental health requires a holistic approach. So if you go to, to the doctor's office for a checkup, one of the things that they do is, for example, they take your blood pressure. You might have good blood pressure, but they can't really tell if you're a healthy person based on that one indicator. They have to look at all these other things, your heart condition, your weight, um, how much activity you get, what your stress level is and so on, and they take blood work and so on and they assess how healthy you are from that. Same thing goes with the lake. Phosphorus, phosphorus loads and nutrients gets a lot of attention on Lake Simcoe, but that's only one or two indicators on the health of the lake. We look at somewhere between 300 and 400 actual individual in indicators on the lake to figure out what's going on, and that's how we assess our lake health. So even though phosphorus loads are going up and down, it doesn't mean necessarily that the lake is unhealthy, but things are different, and, and it needs our attention, and it needs a lot more monitoring that's going on. So how can people help Lake Simcoe? Um, basically, you can join a lake association or a beach association, cottage associations, and so on. You can donate to the foundation because your money goes, goes forward to helping support research and also helping actual stewardship activities that help out on Lake Simcoe to hold this phosphorus back and actually improve the health of the lake. If you live on the lake, maintain your septic systems. And also if you garden within the watershed, use native plants, compost, or phosphorus-free fertilizer because the phosphorus you're adding to your lawn and garden runs off into the streams and tributaries and winds up in the lake. If you have a shoreline um, house or a cottage, stabilize your shoreline and also aquatic plants are buffer zones as well. They reduce that wave action and it's actually protecting your shoreline from erosion. If you're a boater, respect the no wake zones. We don't want the land eroding off into the lake because that also adds phosphorus. If you're a boater or a fisherman, clean, drain, and dry your boat when you're moving between lakes, especially when you're trailering between lakes as well. That's because the, this is the one way that invasive species get into Lake Simcoe and elsewhere is usually by boaters, which are dropping their trailers into the lake. An example of this, zebra mussels and quag mussels can survive seven days out of water attached to the bottom of your hull. Hot summer sun and dry condition, they can survive a week. Same thing, the larvae of these things. Um, if you have a damp bilge with just a little bit of water in it, they can survive a month in that as well. So make sure everything is clean, drained and dried and power washed in between. Also, it's now the law in Lake Simcoe that you can only fish using bait from the Lake Simcoe area as well because we don't want bait getting back and forth. And that's a way that round gobies got into the lake as well is because somebody brought illegal bait fish into Lake Simcoe. So in summary, Lake Simcoe is doing relatively well in terms of overall health, but there are some challenges. We need to understand how these extreme rain events and precipitation events are driving up loads. We also need to understand why the lake is not responding. Uh, we have to look at invasive species and find out if they've restructured the lake and its food web. And I always quote my PhD supervisor on this and that what we're doing is not rocket scientist. It, rocket science, it's a lot, lot more difficult. So lakes are complicated and we have to look at physical, chemical and biological changes and their interactions. If you think there's probably 10,000 different species living inside Lake Simcoe, each one has countless gen di different genetic varieties. They're interacting with the physical and the chemical environment and also with other species as well. And for this reason, we need targeted monitoring to find our answers. So I'd like to thank you for your attention on this as well, um, and also thank the Lake Simcoe Conservation uh, Foundation um, for sponsoring this talk, and also the Honda Canada as well, again, for your generous donation towards the um, Education and Nature Center at Scanlon Creek. And if you have, if you require further information, please check out the Lake Simcoe Foundation.ca website, or you can even contact their executive director, Cheryl Taylor, at either the email or the phone number here. So thank you very much, and thank you for your attention about Lake Simcoe.